It was a crime that horrified the nation. In the summer of 2012, 12-year-old schoolgirl Tia Sharp disappeared from her grandmother's house in South London, prompting one of the most publicised search campaigns in British history. But on the 10th of August, it came to an abrupt end, with a twist so horrific it seemed impossible to comprehend. Tia's body and her killer had been right in front of the cameras the entire time. The sense of loss here is mixed with all sorts of emotions. People feel cheated. Their week-long campaign was a desperate mission to find Tia Sharp. It ended with the 12-year-old found dead in her own grandmother's home. The killer was 37-year-old Stuart Hazel, a man that Tia looked up to and affectionately called Grandad. Detective Nick Scola remembers encountering him during the search for Tia. Throughout all of my meetings with him, his demeanour never really changed. He was always a very quiet person. Uh, he didn't come across as being particularly intelligent or articulate, uh, and he answered questions very simply. But behind Hazel's quiet nature was a ruthless, callous killer. Stuart Hazel committed the most horrible of murders, yet was able to lie to his family, lie to his friends. To do that, he must have been a particularly calculating and vile man. His story begins over 40 years ago. Born on the 26th of May, 1975, in Kingston-upon-Thames, Surrey, Stuart Hazel was introduced to a life of dysfunction from an early age. His father was in and out of prison, so there wasn't a lot of stability. It was quite disorganised, it was quite chaotic. He spent quite a lot of time in the residential care system. He was moved around quite a lot. And I think that did have quite a significant impact on his personality because he didn't really form attachments with other people. So that kind of absence of warmth, that absence of closeness in those early years is something that, that really does shape him. By the time Hazel reached his teens, he'd already begun a life of petty crime. Stuart Hazel started drinking when he was about 13, and that got him into to quite a lot of trouble. So he ended up with his first conviction when he was 14 years old. It was a pattern that continued into adulthood. Between 2001 and 2010, Hazel was in and out of prison for offences ranging from racially aggravated behaviour to drug dealing. In 2003, 28-year-old Hazel began dating Natalie Sharp, a single mother with a three-year-old daughter called Tia. But the relationship was in no way conventional. After they split up, he began seeing Natalie's mother, Christine Bicknell. Well, I think Stuart Hazel is somebody who is quite predatory, um, who identifies people that, that he can get things from, essentially. And he had a relationship with, with Tia's mother that lasted all of about two and a half weeks. And very soon after that, he started a relationship with Tia's grandmother, which, which was much more, more longer lasting. Although 10 years her junior, Hazel moved in to Christine's home on the Lindens estate in New Addington, South London, in 2007. He soon settled in and enjoyed spending time with Christine's now seven-year-old granddaughter, Tia. But he struggled to find work. Well, Stuart Hazel didn't really have a, a regular form of employment. He was in and out of prison so much and it's very difficult to, to maintain regular well-paid steady employment when you have a, a lengthy prison record so he would go from job to job doing work cash in hand and all of that type of thing I said right whatever happens we run throughout so even if we break we keep the recording going so the, so the mic's on constantly and I said just go with it whatever happens go with it so we got in, we set up, and Stuart was really anxious. He was very anxious. And what I needed from him was a really detailed account in real micro detail about what happened from the point that Tia came to the home to the point that she was last seen by him. 
So minute by minute, as much as he could, breaking that down. And that's what I did. And I got him to talk in real detail. Because I knew that every single piece of that interview would be poured over by the police. Because by the Thursday morning, after the phone call that I'd had saying Stuart would give an interview, I knew this was an interview with a killer. No doubt about it at all. Well, if they believe what they read in the papers, they can do whatever they like. Because I know deep down in my heart that Tia walked out of my house. She walked out of there, and I know damn well because she was seen walking down the pathway. Body language expert Robert Phipps was certain Hazel was lying. I loved her to bits. She's like my own daughter. Stuart's behaviour throughout this interview is inconsistent with somebody who is in turmoil, worried, you know, anxious about Tia Sharp being missing. His body language is far too animated. He's shrugging his shoulders a lot. People shrug their shoulders when they're saying, I don't know. But he's giving supposedly truthful st statements and saying, I don't know. I know she made that track down to that way. And I think he was struggling at times, sometimes, to be able to remember what he necessarily said to everybody else. And of course, the more detail I asked of him, the more difficult it became for him to remember exactly what he'd said. Because what he couldn't do, of course, was give me something that he'd given to somebody else differently. Did you do anything? I said, well, no, I bloody didn't. Stuart adds in a lot of detail, which is superfluous to his actual answer. From the co-op, we just got on the T31, because you come out of the co-op and take a right, cut down this little pathway in a bus stop, T31 bus. This is to pad out the story, because it's not the truth. So he's adding in other bits that make it sound truthful. Now, when you talk to most people to, who recall a story, they don't tell it in a logical, orderly sequence. They start saying something, and then they remember something else, and the conversation actually, or, or the statements that they're making, chop and change. Crossed over by the zebra crossing and come home. During normal conversation, people blink around about 20 blinks per minute. If you look at Stuart's behavior, his blinking rate is around about 40 to 45 blinks. This is very high and would indicate that he's actually nervous about what's going on during the interview. He seemed to me somebody who was insincere. Uh, his breaking down, his almost tearful performance smacked to me of somebody who was trying to put on a performance. Uh, the fact that he was sitting there with the T-shirt uh, find Tia, uh, I think there was a picture of her in the background, all suggested to me that this was a man trying too hard to appeal for information when he knew exactly what had happened to her. She walked past me from the front room to go out, and she walked out the front door, that is all I know. What he's doing is he's looking away from the interviewer and down and to his right. This normally indicates that he's using the left-hand side of his brain. This is where you go to construct pictures. If it's a memory that you have in your head, you would generally look up and to the left, which means you're using the right-hand side of your brain, which is generally where most people hold their visual memory. It is, it, it's, a, it's bad, it is bad. It's, no one knows, we're getting false hope, we're getting people seeing sightings. Yeah, it's good to get sightings, but we want 100% definite sighting. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's just, it's crazy. The week-long search for missing 12-year-old schoolgirl Tia Sharp had come to a tragic end. Police had found her body in the loft of her grandmother's house. On Saturday, the 11th of August, 2012, Stuart Hazel, Tia's grandmother's partner, was being questioned on suspicion of her murder. What can you tell me about the murder of Tia Sharp, Stuart? Oh, a couple of minutes, you must listen, please. OK. On the same day, a post-mortem was being carried out at Croydon Mortuary. Clearly, Tia had been dead for a week. And unfortunately, the body had begun to decompose quite badly. The thing with decomposition is that the rate can be very variable. It depends on all sorts of factors. If you've got somebody who's wrapped up to prevent the smell getting out, they're potentially in somewhere that's not particularly warm, which will retard decomposition. In this particular case, the passage of time and the changes that had occurred to the body in the post-mortem period really limited what pathology could tell you. The police still had no evidence that Hazel had killed Tia, 
but a further search of the loft had uncovered her clothes, glasses and, hidden elsewhere in the house, something truly sinister. On this occasion, found pushed behind the door frame on the inside of a cupboard door above head height was a memory card for a digital camera. We recovered deleted images from that card that were quite disturbing. There were some where clearly had searched the internet and found pictures of girls that were not dissimilar looking to Tia in that they had glasses and a similar hairstyle. But worst of all on that memory card was perhaps the most grotesque image I've ever seen. So we took the photograph to show a pathologist and he pointed out the hypostasis on it, which is essentially how the blood pools on a dead body. And this pathologist was of the opinion that that was a picture of a dead girl. Also recorded on the memory card were a number of videos. One was of Tia sitting on a settee. Looked like she's rubbing suntan lotion or some kind of cream into her legs. Clearly, he had given the impression perhaps he was sending a text or something, but all the time he was secretly filming Tia. One of the clips undeniably linked the camera to Hazel. Another video image was particularly unnerving. It showed Hazel filming Tia when she was asleep. He'd obviously gone into her room and was walking around her with the phone in his hand. He also just briefly filmed his own shadow on the wall, menacingly standing over her. On Saturday, August the 11th, 2012, Stuart Hazel was charged with the murder of Tia Sharp. 